as a as a missionary of Africa, um, so uh, that was for the cardinal, that's his position. <laughs> so I want to make the difference between his presentation and my presentation. <laughs> so as a missionary of Africa, a, the commitment to justice and peace is something that has been important for us. And I would say there is an evolution a, in the sense that we are a society working and uh, coming from 40 countries around the world, and we are in 21 African countries. And there has been an evolution in the sense that from the beginning, like many other congregations that were founded in the 19th century, the principal task of many missionaries was to save as many souls as possible, to baptize them so that those poor people do not end up in hell. And uh, the, the emphasis on sacraments, was very important, catechesis, etc. And uh, it was done with good faith. And what, later on, as things went on, we realized that we could not limit ourselves to just saving souls. We have to save the whole person. And indeed, right from the beginning, the church has been one of the pioneers in committing uh, herself to works of development, works of charity, works of justice. And in some places, the first schools and the first dispensaries and the first hospitals have been opened by church institutions. And we can all uh, bear witness to that in the places where we have been. So there is an evolution, we would say. Saving souls, yes. And also the gospel of Christ, where Christ is not known, yes. But in terms, concrete terms of commitment to the person and to what liberates the person. And uh, being attentive to what Cardinal will speak about in terms of personal dimension of sin and systems and structures that are unjust to people. And uh, it is therefore with, with a conviction that we also welcomed the message of the Synod Justice in the World from 1971 to make justice and peace a commitment that is constitutive of being a missionary, part and parcel of what it means to proclaim the good news of Jesus. And looking through our archives, and through our chapter documents, I've seen that from 1974 onwards, for example, there have been very explicit uh, texts about how we engage in justice ministry in Africa and elsewhere. But again and again, chapter after chapter, every six years, there's been a coming back to that, as though to convince all of us, it's not something that people get convinced of overnight, and people getting out of soil habits is not easy. So, over and over, over and over, there's been that emphasis. And uh, if there is that emphasis, it is because it is something that is important. So, why do we commit ourselves to justice and peace in Africa as a missionary society? We, uh, this year, we are celebrating the 125th anniversary of our founders' uh, commitment in the anti-slavery campaign in which he received a mandate from Pope Leo XIII, and uh, that brought him to different European towns in order to speak against the atrocities of slavery, especially in the interior of Africa, and the transatlantic slave trade. And uh, with pressure in the public opinion, something was able to be done, and in 1890, a decision was taken in order to, to fight against slavery from a legal perspective. Celebrating this event for us this year reminds us that we are committed to justice and peace in very concrete ways. That event, later on in today's tense, would have been termed a genocide because in the according to the statistics that he shared at the time, it was actually depopulating Africa of, of, of about two million people per year. And uh, would it have gone on more time, Africa would have been an empty continent, and maybe it would have been easier for the land grabbers. <laughs> and uh, I say, for, from his perspective, and from for us as a society, a word that he said makes us realize that our commitment to justice and peace can be founded here, and is founded here. He quoted a poet, Terence, saying, I am a man and nothing human is foreign to me. I am a man, and injustice towards others revolves my heart. I am a man, and oppression offends my nature. 
I am a man, and what I would like people to do to restore to me freedom, honor, and sacred bonds of family, I want to do to restore to the sons and daughters of this unhappy race family, honor, and freedom. I am a man. A, he was French, so don't uh, think that when he says he's a man, he excludes women. Comme on dit en français, quand je dis homme, j'embrasse les femmes. So, I am a human being, and what I, what I want to be done to me, what dehumanizes me, I will fight against it. That is why we wrote our commitment to justice and peace. Because there are different forms of slavery that are going on today, and we feel we have to say something about it. Some of them were mentioned today, yesterday, and some will be studied again today, so I don't need to go into that, but we all know the names, like human trafficking, a, a forced labor, prostitution, debt bondage, etc. So how do we commit ourselves to this uh, justice ministry in Africa? Our last chapter, 2010, made a link that is important for us. It said, in the concrete life situations, what we often see is that people meet each other, people encounter each other, and it is in the encounter with each other that is discover what the problems are. Therefore, we root in order to practice justice ministry, we've got to encounter the other who is different from us through his or her religion, through his or her social status. And for us, we put together justice and peace and integrity of creation and encounter and dialogue, ecumenical encounter and interreligious encounter. And uh, we know different documents of the church have promoted respectful attitude of encounter with other religions. And uh, we would like to take that into consideration in our encounter. Encounter the other with respect and together with the other who is different maybe even from me because of his or her religion to look for just solutions, to look for ways of changing what we're going through. I've seen situations, for example, in the travel around, just to quote one example, for example, in Tanzania, in a parish called Tandale, in the outskirts of, of uh, Dar es Salaam, where Muslims, Christians, and African traditional religion pra practitioners live together in very poor conditions, and this poverty has created a solidarity among them and they try to look through little projects how to get out of this situation through offering, for example, scholarship to young children from the area who are needy and who are intelligent in order that they can study somewhere else. All different things, little projects on the spot in order to fight against uh, uncleanliness and uh, other things that are happening there. And I'm sure all of us who have been to Africa in different parts no such similar examples. We know that the services we offer, we do not discriminate. We offer them to everybody. And that is why we say encounter and dialogue have to precede commitment to justice and peace because we are all human beings. We are all created in the image and likeness of God. And to come back to our founder, whatever dehumanizes another person, we have the duty to fight against it. And uh, recently, one of our churches in Zender, in Niger, was attacked after the Friday afternoon prayer. It was desecrated, the statue of the Virgin Mary was thrown down, the liturgical books were burned, the statue was broken, and many things. They, they, they were even going for the presbytery to, to get at the, at the conference. A couple of days after that, the first persons to come and say, we regret what has happened, this does not correspond to our faith, were the Muslim neighbors and it is in a place where the Muslims are the majority. So that is to say, in the face of violence, in the face of intolerance, in the face of fundamentalism, we cannot make cheap generalizations that one religion equals violence, and because of that, not engage in dialogue with this religion in view of searching for just structures. And for us to help us to put justice and peace and encounter and dialogue in the forefront, we have appointed a coordinator who will help the whole society share information and look for ways of, of moving forward. So my last point is, where would faith-based groups like AFJN help us? We identify three areas and three ways in which we practice justice and peace and encounter and dialogue. The first area is through services. 
different societies, we render services to the poor, we render services to the marginalized, we render services in terms of education, health, a development, etc. The second area in which we live justice and peace is accompaniment. Accompaniment of people in situations of conflict, violence, stay on when everybody else is falling out. And we've had situations like that, for example, in Rwanda, in Algeria, in Mali, in Ivory Coast, where missionaries opted to stay with the people in that type of situation, whereas other people had already packed their bags and gone, or were told, it is too dangerous for you to stay here, find a safe place. And it has, been, it has meant, in some cases, paying their, their lives for it. In Algeria, we have lost four conferences who were killed, which is Yuzu, and many other people of other congregations have been killed, and there is currently a course going on for beatification, eventually, of all those pastoral agents who have given their lives for dialogue and for justice in Algeria. So that is the second area. The third area, so I'll say the first, these first two areas, we do not have trouble. We are sufficiently prepared through our formation in order to offer service to others, in order to offer accompaniment. But the third area, where we are less prepared, but where it is important and where AFGN has a role to play and can play for all of us, is the area of advocacy. And advocacy so that you can influence the decision makers in view of just policies and just relations with Africa. Think of a small parish. How can the parish make its voice heard at the UN? How can the parish make its voice heard even in the local government? The tools are not often there. And even how to proceed, we do not always have that. So there is an important and essential contribution that faith-based groups like AFGM can make. And uh, we can influence individuals, and uh, we can influence the grassroots, but we need to be able to help, to be helped in order to say how do we influence and how does that influence locally go a bit higher and bear fruit. In view of that, as members of AFJN and other faith groups, we need to collaborate and we need also to feed in the right information, to feed in the right information to AFJN and other faith-based groups so that they can act on our behalf where they have openings, where they have the possibility to have an influence, they can go with the right type of information. And then I would expect that in return, something comes back to the base so that we can see, has the information that has been fed in really been relevant to the point of making a difference or not? So, my brothers and sisters, as you know, the life expectancy in Africa and elsewhere has improved. AFGN is 30 years old, and in many places, 30 years old is not yet a lot. Although 30 years old, in uh, some parts of the world, you are already an old man. But 30 years old means that there is still a future ahead for AFGN. And I will pray that this future that is ahead, all of us together, we'll be able to make it something that is worthwhile by bringing our faith into our engagements and by putting Africa on the world map so that Africa will not just be consumers, but producers and influencers of policies that are just for everybody, and in particular for Africa. Thank you very much. based on uh, what we've heard from Father Richard and his summary of uh, the Cardinal's comments. We have two mics like we did last evening, and then also we have two mics that can be passed through the crowd. So if, uh, if you prefer to stay at your seat, just raise your hand and someone will, will come around to you. 